Praise the Lord. We're going to read uh, Psalm 119 and verses 49 to 56. This is the word Zain. Uh, remember the word unto thy servant, upon which thou hast caused me to hope. This is my comfort in my affliction. For thy word hath quickened me, the proud have had me greatly in derision. Yet have I not declined from thy law. I remembered thy judgments of old, O Lord, and have comforted myself. Horror hath taken hold upon me because of the wicked that forsake thy law. Thy statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. I have remembered thy name, O Lord, in the night and have kept thy law. This I had because I kept thy precepts. So we're going back to verse number 49 and it says, Remember the word unto thy servant, upon which thou hast caused me to hope. Here the psalmist is speaking to the Lord God to remember what God had told him, the promise that God had given to him. And in that promise that he had received, he had hoped in that promise. In fact, the psalmist states that he had hope in that promise and God had given him hope through the promise. So the feelings that the psalmist had was hope. So when God gives a promise, there is hope. God establishes hope through his promise, through his word. There is hope because of his word. There is a promise. There is hope because of the promise. Hope existed in this life due to the promise that God has given. And in this case, the promise that the psalmist had received, he had hope in it. He had hope in that promise to be fulfilled because God had already given the promise. Thus, the promises of God, no matter what promises they are, lead us to have a hope in those promises. They're from God. We have hope in those promises. As Christians, we know that his word is true and that he will complete his promises to us. Of course, the fulfillment of his promises will occur. Mankind may not know the day nor the hour in which the fulfillment of those promises come through. But in the word of God and scripture in the Old Testament, uh, some have been complete or they have been fulfilled in the New Testament. Some even in the Old Testament. But uh, in scripture, there are different verses that bring us to an understanding if those promises have been fulfilled. One great example is the promise of the Holy Spirit. Yes, the Holy Spirit is a promise. And people can receive it today. And it can be received. And it's such a wonderful experience to receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. One great example is the promise of the Holy Spirit. In Joel, it was prophesied that on the day of Pentecost, 
Hallelujah. There was a promise of the Holy Spirit being poured out on that day. In Joel, it was prophesied, and on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, it was fulfilled in part. Peter declared that the promise that was given in Joel chapter 2 had been fulfilled that particular day. Of course, that would continue to happen throughout the church age, the pouring out of God's Spirit upon mankind. Here the psalmist declared that God had given him a promise. It seems here that the promise had definitely been given, but he had not seen the fulfillment of that promise yet. So he had hope and he was clinging on to hope that one day that promise would be fulfilled. And he knew he had faith in that hope. <laughs> he had faith in that promise. He had hope in that promise that it would come true. And you, he didn't have to doubt. And you don't have to doubt God's promises. God's promises are yea and amen. They will happen. They will occur. So, in other words, the promise had not yet been fulfilled for him, though he genuinely hoped in it, because it was the word of promise which had been given over to him. Thus, he trusted and hoped in the word of the promise of God. Today, we hear and learn of the word of God probably uh, we are able to learn, to read, to study, to, to hear messages so much more than in the Old Testament. Even before the Internet, the Internet has made it so possible to hear, to study, to really dig down deep. Why not? <laughs> this is really a, such a blessing to do. Hallelujah. We can do so daily. We can learn in such a, a deep way. You know, the people uh, make goals in their life. Goals should be focused on the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And in knowing more deeply the word of God, that is one of the things that really can help a person in his spiritual life and even help others because we will be able to counsel others and because we have come to the certain knowledge of the word of God and you know and possibly a wisdom also and an understanding then we can counsel others that you know, it follow the word and the principle of God's word. We can spend many hours reading. We can listen. We can go in depth into the word of God, which brings us into a better understanding. It can bring to us a deeper faith, a better hope, and so on. It's not time really to go just to the surface. It's time to go more deeply. We've got so much today, the possibility to go deeper, to dig deep down, to put our roots down. A tree, an oak tree, puts its roots deep down or the, the, those um, sequoias, they intertwine one with another so that they can be deeply integrated with other folks. Hallelujah. But an oak tree digs down and puts its roots down deep. And we need the Word of God. We need to be stabilized in the Word of God, not drift away from the truth that is in the Word of God, especially the message of the gospel. The psalmist only had that part of the Old Testament to read. The temple was a place to hear 
the word of God along with synagogues and its precepts and statutes were taught there. And no doubt a man in his household used the word of God to bring it to possibly his children. God had caused people to have much hope. Hope was introduced through his promises. Hope was introduced through the word. The promises of God bring hope to a life. The more promises that God gives to his people, the more hope that spreads around. There is hope because there are promises from God's word, from God himself. Hope is like the after effect of the promises given by God. Any promises of God given to mankind, there will be hope spread in the heart of mankind. It is a great thing that God has given us that promise. For hope comes along with it. Spreading here, spreading there. It's a great comfort to have the knowledge that God's presence, his presence today comes along with his promises. He has promised in the Old Testament in Joel uh, concerning the Holy Ghost and the outpouring of the Spirit of God. And today that is being fulfilled. It's not completely done with because the the um, pouring of the Spirit of God is still happening even today. And so there is hope. There is hope because that promise is there. Hallelujah. Praise God. So the more promises, the more hope. And God has given many promises. The psalmist is reminding God that, hey, he has a promise and he's hanging on to hope. It's a way that he can be assured of the promise in his heart, in his mind, that God will fulfill his promise to him. Verse number 50 says, This is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. The promise of the Lord is that which gives him comfort. Today, of course, we have not only the, pro the word of God and his promises that comfort us, but we also have the spirit of God that comforts us too. His promise is a his spirit is a great comfort to our soul. He mentioned that he had, the psalmist did, affliction. And it would come upon him through various means, no doubt. Because in this life, we do face some heartbreaking moments and some affliction to a degree. And so when he read the word of God or remembered the promise of God, hey, there was a comfort there. Hallelujah. Even though he was going through some troublesome times, still there is comfort in the fact that God has promised, hey, throughout his word, uh, certain things, and we can cling on to it, uh, that the promise, and then hope. Hallelujah. Praise God. So he was reminded of God's beauty in his promises, and that those promises, the word of God, provided to him that life. It quickened him, brought to him that spiritual life. Amen. The word of God brings life to us. He gives us great benefits of truth. His word helps us through the afflictions. Everyone that we face and we are able to have a comfort in his word and in his promises. His promises are yea and amen. There's a beautiful comfort in the blessings of knowing the word of God. In verse 51, it says, the proud have had me greatly in derision, yet have I not declined from thy law. Who are the proud? The proud are the ones who display, to display inordinate self-esteem or show a sense of one's superiority and scorn for what one regards as beneath him, according to Webster's. Thus here it appears that the proud feel that others are lower in rank 
dignity or quality, Webster says. This is the reason why the psalmist feels the proud with their feelings of superiority over him in their worth will greatly deride him, or they did deride him. Possibly even as to his announcement and hope in the promises of God. Concerning the law, he has not turned aside from the following of the law of Moses. He had not turned aside. He said, yet have I not declined from thy law or turned aside away from following and obeying the law of Moses. In fact, within the law of Moses, there were promises too, or there are promises that are of comfort. However, the proud will look at his actions, possibly even his hopes, and try their best to deride him in those hopes so as to belittle the hope in God and his walk in God. Though the others, those who feel themselves above the others, um, they are full of pride. The ones who are proud are those who would do the following. For example, they might, quote unquote, laugh at what seems ridiculous or contemptible uh, to them obeying the law of Moses, for example, or even following to a, uh, the right degree, the, to a T, one could say, the uh, gospel message today. The, the, the use of ridicule, mockery, or scorn to belittle or to show contempt to the ones who they feel are below them, maybe the ones that really follow the true gospel message they're the ones that are derided possibly the most because they want to influence the others not to follow, not to cling to that which is the truth. It is within their thinking then that there are others beneath them and they will think that those who follow the real truth are beneath them because they don't have it. Hallelujah. Much like one might imagine the Pharisees had thought the sinners were very much beneath their dignity. They might have ridiculed or exhibited scorn towards them, especially towards their sinfulness. They had done so to the adulterous woman, the sinner praying in the uh, parable of Jesus who was derided by the Pharisee that was praying. And they even scorned Jesus himself, who was on the cross. Yet he was the most innocent one. He was the king of the Jews, and he was doing so much for everyone. How could they scorn him? How could they ridicule him right there when he's bleeding and he's feeling the least bit of mercy towards him. Uh, the Roman soldiers have just finished uh, beating him to a pulp, one could say, and letting that blood flow. And here, on top of that, is no pity whatsoever from the Pharisees who begin to scorn and ridicule him, saying, Oh, he saved others, but he can't save himself. They were thinking they were above him, but actually, and no, most certainly, they were below him because there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That name is above every other name, and every name that is under heaven or in heaven, uh, uh, under heaven, on earth, or even under the earth, there is no other name that is greater. There's only one name that we can be saved by. It's the name of Jesus Christ. There is no time to mock at that name, to disregard that name, to put that name aside. That name is the highest name. That name is to be honored, not ridiculed. Jesus was innocent of all charges, yet the Pharisees, who thought they 
had the law and they obeyed the law, they were ridiculing the one who gave the law. So they were actually the ones who were beneath him, but he, instead of acting indifferent to them or deriding them, which he could have, he could have scorned them or said something to belittle them, but he did not. Instead, what came out of his voice, what out of his mouth was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That is how Jesus dealt with those who ridiculed him. But as well, everyone who participated in the crucifixion, of course, he had forgiven. Everyone who had sinned against him, he had forgiven them. He at the cross, hallelujah. Surely he could have, but he chose not to scorn, ridicule, or belittle others. He had the power, he had the authority, he could have done it, but he chose not to. He chose not to scorn. He chose not to belittle, not to deride other people. Surely he could have, but he chose not to. Instead of speaking to deride or belittle the other thief on the cross, there was one who did, ex you know, kind of like extend his hand towards Jesus or wish that Jesus would extend his hand towards him, though they were uh, nailed to the cross. He chose instead to be quiet to the one who uh, was not reaching for him, but to offer paradise to the one who did humble himself on the cross because he could do it. And he could at that moment reach and save a soul right before his death at the last moment, the last few moments of his life. Jesus cared enough and he does care for people even when they are on their deathbed of course his deathbed was not a bed it was a cross and so he believed that Jesus was the king of the Jews and he spoke in faith of the kingdom of Jesus Christ he said remember me when you come into your kingdom and Jesus remembered him and he extended his hand of mercy. That in itself was marvelous. He, that thief on the cross, had faith in Jesus. More faith than the Pharisees who were down below him ridiculing. Saying, he saved others. Why can't he save himself? Well, he's busy saving other people. He's busy saving the thief on the cross. He's still saving other people. Even today, he's out saving others. Hallelujah. So the last few moments of that, the, the life of that thief on the cross on the earth, he was, God, Jesus was right there. He was opening the door for salvation for him at that la, those last moments of his life. Jesus was ready. He's always ready to, to listen to those who, even at the last moment, decide to turn to him. But yet, it is better to always come to him now. Come to him before one other moment passes. Because we don't know the day and the hour that we will isk, uh, leave this world. So... Jesus was ready to save the thief on the cross in the last few moments, giving him a chance at eternal life. Of course, some will say, well, he wasn't baptized, wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit, but yet the Holy Spirit was not given yet. Even, even a baptism in Jesus' name had not even been provided. And Jesus was there to extend his hand and he could, he had the power, he had the authority. He saved him, brought him into paradise. He gave him a chance at eternal life. He took that chance. And no doubt he's thanking God that God put him on the cross right next to Jesus so that he could speak to him at that moment.
Verse number 52 says, I remembered thy judgments of old, O Lord, and have comforted myself. Here he points to the judgments of the Lord as being a method of comforting himself with them. What judgments could he have remembered? He could have remembered what happened when the Lord judged the Egyptians and blessed Israel in the form, forming of the nation, the escape out of Egypt and the leading of God's hand in the wilderness. He could have remembered the judgments that brought the Israelites into the promised land as God had fulfilled his promise to Israel by bringing them into the promised land. That is because he is filled with the hope of the promise of God. He remembered the judgments of old, that which could have been, no doubt, the promise given to Israel of bringing them into the promised land. That it did happen that the people, because of that promise, had hope in God's words and he would, God's word, and he would complete or fulfill that promise. And it did become a reality. It actually and truthfully took place because Israel had left Israel. Uh, Israel had left Egypt and had gone into the promised land due to the promise of God's word. Thus, in the scripture, there were promises made and promises kept by God that the psalmist could turn to and be comforted by them and know of a certainty that even though at that time the promise for him might not have been fulfilled yet, it would be fulfilled because one can have hope that it will without doubt come to pass there is no need of doubting the promises of God but to stand in them to confine in them and uh, know that one should do his will verse number 53 says horror hath taken hold upon me because of the wicked that forsake thy law here is something that he had seen happen those that beforehand were righteous and were doing the law of Moses, the law of God, became, as it is pronounced here, wicked because they had forsaken the law. It was not any law, for it is mentioned as the law of God and not man's law or regulation. The law was given to Moses, and the psalmist was an observer that there were some who abided by the law, but then for some odd reason to, forsook the law and no longer observed it that was observed by the psalmist and it was sad the psalmist was sad that he could have become much more saddened that they had forsaken the law of God and turned away from it the psalmist expressed an emotion that came and overwhelmed him a feeling of horror it was not because he had watched a horror movie but it was because in reality he had seen with his own eyes the righteous forsaking God's law and turning to weakness, wickedness for that for him that was a horrible example but also it was something that turned his emotions to horror and not comfort he had comfort in the promises of God but in those promises there was a promise for the wicked too that they will no doubt be judged according to the word of God he had observed them follow or obey the law but at one point in their lives they no longer observe the law of God that to him brought him a horror the question might come into one's mind why was it that he felt such a horror he knew the judgments of God and the promises of God that they that would be fulfilled therefore the promises of God for the righteous to bring them into comfort for the blessings and so on but then there are the wicked they will receive their reward too but Jesus had said something about Judas. It would, be, it would have been better that he had not been born than for him to have known the way and have gone and did what he did, gone astray. Verse number 54 says, they, Thy statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. Here is something that he clings to 
the fact that the statutes of God have been his songs. It is no doubt that the psalmist and those who made the songs to sing unto the Lord for the people of Israel were wishing to do so. It was something in their desire to do so. They came across it. They said, let's sing this. They wanted songs that glorified and had given praise to God. Therefore, the psalmist here states that he had taken the statutes of the Lord and had made them his songs in the house. It was something that he was proud of to take the statutes and make them songs. He must have been guided by the power of God or the inspiration of God to bring forth a lovely and powerful song unto God for bringing honor and glory to him. No doubt the psalmist must have led others or had been a model for others to do the same, to make the statutes songs to sing unto God. Surely that would also help the people to memorize the statutes of God and bring them to remembrance each time that they did sing them. You know, they had a deeper purpose when they had their songs. They wanted to remember his statutes. For them back in those days, it was probably much harder to get copies of the Word of God. They probably might have had only one per family, maybe, if they uh, were not able to spend as much time in reading, studying, and so on in the Word of God. They, they were there uh, singing the statutes. But when he or others had made songs of the statue of the Lord, that meant it was bringing to the forefront something that they should have and did remember while they had sung and they had opportunity to remember it and to obey God's will for them. Verse 55 says, I have remembered thy name, O Lord, in the night and have kept thy law. Praise God. Therefore, here it is stated that he had remembered the name of the Lord. That is, though they knew not the name of the Lord Jesus Christ back in the Old Testament, they did focus in on that concept, the name of the Lord. They knew that the name of the Lord was powerful. They knew that the name of the Lord was wonderful. They adored it but they could only say the name of the Lord. There's something that is to remember the name of the Lord, even though it was nighttime when many people might go off to do things that may be evil or not beneficial. Hallelujah. But they had remembered the name of the Lord during the night. There's a fact that he would follow and obey. That is beneficial for those who look forward to living for God, obeying him, biding, abiding in, the truth in that, their world it was the law of Moses verse number 56 this I had because I had because I kept thy precepts and so here the psalmist kept the precepts of the Lord not just in word but in deed to the psalmist it did not matter if it was during the day or sometimes during the night he still kept himself in the law of God, meaning that he abided by its precepts and statutes that he had studied and had come to the recognition of it. His knowledge of the word of God was no doubt because he diligently studied the word of God and kept it in mind. There came a blessing upon him for doing so, valuing the word of God. That is something that others should benefit from. They should put the priority in the word of God. That is something so special, so beneficial for anyone and everyone to understand, contemplate, and abide by. No doubt to remember the statutes of the Lord God is much easier when it is part of one's routine. The reading of the word of God on a daily basis. The hearing of the word of God at church or at home. The testimonies of God, what God has done for us, listening to them and also speaking them in one's life. Through the word of God, these things help us to remember those things of the word of God. Today, more than ever before, there's a need for people to study the word of God. We can do so 
more in depth. Second Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There are those who might believe that they're approved of God, but the truth is God is the one to approve, not mankind. When one studies the word of God, the priority is to find the truth of salvation in it. For those who teach and preach, that is of great importance and necessity for others and for oneself. When will shame come upon one regarding the word of God? If one who has taught others and have not come to the into the truth of the apostolic doctrine, the teaching of the message of the gospel for the church age, it follows that mankind no doubt would be ashamed at the judgment. That shame would be the greatest for one had been teaching and preaching others uh, to believe in God, but their message of salvation didn't have the power in it. The Bible does say in Romans 1.16 that the message of the gospel has power in it. Verse uh, Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The importance of having the right gospel message is more important today than even one could say the Israelite obeying the law of Moses during the time of the law of Moses. Hallelujah. The gospel message is that which provides power to others when they obey what is said as the gospel. As Acts 2, through Acts 2 it tells us. They can receive power and what Jesus had said was necessary to preach and teach that message. Uh, the message that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. You stay with that. You're fine. Obey it and you'll be on that road. Nothing but the truth is needed in this age and generation. Hallelujah. It is beneficial. It is greatly beneficial. And 